Ladies and gentlemen, a person I'm going to invite at this stage and introduce to you is a, is a devoted Atlantist. He wrote his PhD thesis on the United States policy towards Europe, towards disarmament uh, in the 20th of, of the 20th century. When he joined Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland, he worked very hard to enlarge the alliance, to make the great vision of Europe one, whole, and peace true. Then he became a politician. He was a member of a democratic uh, community of the alliance, NATO Assembly. Now he worked very hard to make alliance responsive to the challenges it faced from the outside. Ladies and gentlemen, if we look at the map of the eastern flank, we see at north Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. We see in the south Bulgaria, Romania, Visegrad countries. And in the center of this map, you see Poland, a key, a pivotal country in our thinking about strengthening the alliance, about strengthening the eastern flank of this, uh, the most effective defense alliance we ever had. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an enormous pleasure for me to welcome and introduce to this stage Dr. Witold Waszczykowski, Poland's Foreign Minister. Please join me in welcoming him. I thank you, Mr. Director, and uh, I thank you, Madam Secretary Albright. For me, it's a great challenge to say something smarter after this uh, very wise and kind words about the contemporary situation and uh, to listen to your advice about it for the future. But I will try. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to be here with all of you today at this uh, flagship security expert forum organized on the margins of NATO summit here in Warsaw. I would like to express my gratitude to the Polish Institute of International Affairs, the Polish Minister of Defense, NATO Public Diplomacy Divisions, and all the co-organizers of this major event, all of these who are responsible for creation of this event. I would also like to warmly welcome all conference participants to Warsaw a city with a very rich historical and cult cultural heritage. And I hope that uh, this gathering of politicians, thought leaders and experts will herald a new formula of experts meeting that accompany NATO summits, forging an increasingly stronger link between diplomacy and public uh, opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of my today's speech will revolve around issues that are key to NATO adaptations, which is, which is adaptation to preserve the peace. First of all, we have to remember that this adaptation is a long-term and a strategic process. Change within NATO should be seen as a constant feature of the Alliance and its ongoing task. The need to change may seem obvious, but the nature of the changes and the speed of, the, of which they are implemented may not be as clear cut. Second, the preservation of peace requires a constant effort and strategic initiative. Bold decisions are necessary if you want to face a variety of current challenges and to deter any aggression effectively. This also means that in Warsaw, we should make the best, the best use of a decision made at the previous summits, especially in Chicago and 
and, and ways by ensuring the full implementation. At the same time, the Warsaw Summit must allow us to challenge old paradigms and perceptions in order to achieve new breakthrough. It's a Latin saying, audaces fortuna juvat, fortune favors the bold. Third, I would like to recall that historical consciousness should always be present in our deliberations on the most appropriate response to current challenges. When we look at the international relations after World War II from the systematic, uh, systemic perspective, it is tempting to conclude that it was a period of peace and relative stability. Half a century without a major war was indeed an, uh, an achievement in, in itself. A success fueled by smart and flexible strategies that struck the right balance between diplomacy and hard power. A mix of prudent actions and calculated risks. It was also a policy based on realism, aimed at first place at avoiding the catastrophe rather than creating an ideal world, no matter the costs. But we have to remember that any policy must uh, contain a grain of idealism in order to succeed in the long term. In the Western strategy, the grain was the constant faith in the strength of the Western values and the belief that the inherently weak and unstable evil empire of the time, sooner or later, must collapse. But the concept of peace encompasses more than just the absence of war. Hence, the peace of the Cold War was highly delusive. It was only when the Soviet Union finally collapsed that Poland achieved the type of peace that allowed us to cultivate our freedom, our national heritage, and the principles that are part of the Polish national DNA, those of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Many of you will rightly recognize the preamble to the North Atlantic Treaty in these words. It's important to acknowledge that 67 years after the signing of this groundbreaking treaty, its goals remain unchanged, but the means and strategies to achieve them are not yet not, not set in stone. This means, and, uh, strate this means and strategies must constantly evolve, fully embracing the changes we have uh, been observing on the global st stage at the Warsaw package will confirm. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in order to maintain peace, it's also necessary to remember past wars and be aware of uh, potential ones. The malicious saying that generals always prepare for the last war is only partially true. <clears throat> During the Second World War, Poland lost almost a fifth of its citizens, including three million Jews. 30% of uh, its wealth was damaged and 80% of industry was destroyed. We have to bear in mind that the present NATO summit is taking place in a very exceptional city, the city which was literally ceased to exist and became a pile of rubble during the six years long military conflict. During his speech at the University of Warsaw in May this year, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg underlined that what the past generations went through is a powerful reminder of the importance of a collective security and the need to prevent the war. No one could say it better. Distinguished guests, after World War II, the West responded with resolve to the challenges of the communists and won the Cold War. 
In this respect, the North Atlantic Alliance fulfilled its major strategic role. In a way, it could uh, have become a victim of its own success. But thanks to its ability to adapt, the Alliance brought about a lasting change. It took on a new roles, which were nevertheless closely related to its main task of collective defense. At the London summit in 1990, the Alliance opened itself up to partnership and missions that went beyond Article 5, that is, collective security and crisis management. It was at the time that the phrase out of area, out of business, was coined. The London decisions bore witness to the unique nature of NATO and its ability to combine continuation and adaptability. It goes without uh, saying that NATO and the European Union extended the borders of democracy and stability. Stabilization missions have achieved positive results in the way that the Western Balkans have changed. If we compare today's peace a key of Central Europe and even of the Western Balkans to that of the post-Soviet area and to the frozen conflicts, the differences are staggering. The Western Balkans have become more stable and all the countries in the region aspire to become European Union members with NATO as the key guarant of regional security. From this point of view, the situation in Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Azerbaijan, and Armenia differ greatly with Russia's continuous presence supposedly aimed at keeping peace, while in fact desperately trying to maintain the remnants of its, of its geopolitical sphere of influence. We cannot agree to Russia's military presence on a given territory against the sovereign will of a state this territory belongs to, according to international law. Russia was not deceived by the West. Nobody promised Moscow. Nobody promised Moscow imperial dominance over its neighbors. Once again, nobody promised Moscow imperial dominance over its neighbors. On the contrary, Russia was offered the broadest possible form of cooperation, a privileged relationship with, of, uh, with our institutions. It was invented, uh, Russia was invited to the Council of Europe, G8, the Council of the Baltic Sea States, the Organization of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, and the Arctic Council. The list is even longer. It also started uh, cooperating with the European Union, which initiated the unprecedented di dialogue with Moscow. The North Atlantic Alliance opened dialogue with the Kremlin too, especially under the Partnership for Peace and the NATO-Russia Council. Unfortunately, Russia chose a different path. Our efforts were not met with reciprocity. On the contrary, our efforts were met with further unreasonable demands, distrust, and confrontation. The Kremlin considers its intervention in Syria, which started without consulting NATO, to be, to be its sovereign right. At the same time, Russia denies our right to carry out military actions on our own territories according to the security requirements of our countries in the face of challenges posed by Moscow itself. Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, Nagorno-Karabakh, Crimea, Donbas, and former Yugoslavia. There is a long list of conflicts after 1991, none of, of which was solved with Russia's support. Putin Russia is not a constructive player. Madam Secretary just mentioned is a provocateur. 
It thrives on a instability and therefore achieving peace and order in a given region simply weakens Moscow influence. Its values and aims are not similar to ours. It's a heavy exporter of destabilization and more often than not, we find ourselves at the opposing ends where conflict resolution comes to play. In uh, 1958, the Soviet Union was uh, much more powerful than today's Russia. But the then Secretary General of NATO, Paul Henry Spark, said, we must make peace with the Russians. A very sound idea. To make peace with Russians, there is a precondition. And here the reasoning is a little more difficult to follow. Soviet Russia must be asked to evacuate all the territory of East Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. That's the end of a quotation. Paul Henry Spak was neither a Paul nor a Bolt, and it's uh, therefore hard to speak in his case of any historically driven Russophobia, which is currently a common practice of Putin's propaganda against our countries. Spak did not speak about the members of NATO, but about the reasons for, it, for which NATO felt threatened. Nowadays, we also have to reject any time of wishful thinking with regard to a pragmatic cooperation with Russia as long as it keeps on invading its neighbors. Speaking about the present NATO summit itself, about our expectations and goals with regards to this major gathering, I would like to underline, first of all, that in Warsaw we should review the effects of Chicago and Wales and make new decisions on how to alliance can adapt. The Warsaw Summit is a, also a unique opportunity to enhance cooperation with the European Union and the other institutional and individual partners. Finally, the summit will confirm one of the most crucial and most effective of NATO's policies, the open door policy, with the acceptance of Montenegro as a member. We need to bear in mind that NATO open policy has to be continuously underpinned by practical cooperation and meaningful pragmatic assistance to the countries wishing to join the alliance. The Warsaw Summit will constitute the next stage of strengthening capabilities, readiness and responsiveness, so that any potential aggressors deems an attack on any member of the alliance as futile. Against this background, it is a key that members fulfill the obligation regarding 2% of GDP to be spent on defense. The summit is uh, expected, and rightly so, to change the very foundation of NATO's defense and deterrence philosophy. From relying almost exclusively on military reinforcements in the face of crisis, to a much more credible approach linking reinforcements with forward deployments and prepositioning of military, military equipment. This is exactly what the current unstable security environment calls for. On a different note, but still within the same line of thought, cyber threats should be on the list of possible triggers for the, for the invocation of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. In fact, the NATO summit in Warsaw could be a groundbreaking in this regard. 20 years after the summit in Madrid, I had the pleasure to participate in this summit. Another groundbreaking decision will be made, a decision concerning the permanent presence of allies on the eastern flank. For more than 15 years, loyal and committed members of NATO from the region 
have been sending tens of thousands of soldiers to the missions in the Balkans, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Presence is not a provocation. Absence is. Absence is a provocation. Experience has taught us that preparedness deters aggressions and the weakness invites it, as Ronald Reagan once said. In order to deter aggression credibly and discourage any policy of brinkmanship, we need solidarity and engagement of all allies. We appreciate especially those allies who are willing to assume the role of framework nation, of forces to be stationed in Poland and in the Baltic states. Their decisions confirm that the spirit of solidarity is truly alive within NATO. We especially welcome the Canadian permanent military presence in Europe. We have always known that the Alliance may count on your support in difficult times. <clears throat> Poland is well known for its hospitality all over the world. We are going to prove this hospitality with respect to the Allied forces to be deployed in Poland. Our host nation support will be meaningful and the necessary infrastructure will be ready to use. All formal requirements for the entrance and transfer of NATO forces throughout Poland will be limited to minimum, especially in case of emergency. We have been providing the necessary host nation support to the ongoing construction of a ballistic missile defense base in Rejikovo. Once it becomes fully operational in 2018, the major installation will constitute a permanent US NATO military presence in Poland. The presence of multinational corps in Szczecin is also an important signal in this context, but we need Germany to unequivocally understand its, the strategic necessity, not only of our own region, but of the whole NATO, for even more presence and engagement on the eastern flank. Maintaining security is a country's main responsibility. Security is becoming an increasingly broader notion. Some say security has become hybrid in nature, as have threats become hy hybrid. The army is no longer the only source of defense. Preparing the civilian sector is a critical enabler of collective security and a pillar of resilience. Civilians provide 90% of NATO transport, 50% of its satellite communications relying to security requirements, and 70% of host nation support. The appropriate preparation in these respects involves such fundamental matters as government, continuity, and basic services for our citizens. As I have mentioned before, NATO's further adaptation must take into account developments on the international arena. This implies revisiting the alliance cooperation with international organizations, among them the European Union and the United Nations. The European Union has been in a crisis mode. This is a common opinion right now for at last a few years. It has recently suffered another setback with the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the Union. Although Britain may leave the European Union project for good, it will not leave Europe, understood as a geopolitical space. As Prime Minister Cameron stated at a press conference after the European Council meeting on 28th of June, while Britain is leaving the European Union, it will not, it should not, and in my view, it won't turn its back on Europe. Thus, the United Kingdom will remain an important European power, 
and a crucial member of NATO. My advice to some hot-headed politicians would be to calm down and stop talking about punishing a democratic state for its democratic chores or repeating the mantra of more Europe without taking account of the most important of European values, <clears throat> that of democratic legitimacy. The Warsaw Summit is just one step, uh, we hope decisive step, in the process of NATO strategic adaptation. In depth, pace and ultimate achievements will not be measured by the number and length of statements and declarations, but rather by the efficiency and effectiveness of our common defense and deterrence. We must show resolve in our decision making, pragmatism and its implementation and strategic patience in its evaluations. Only then can we preserve the peace for the present and future generation, which is, after all, the overarching aim of every worldwide action in the field of international politics. We have a rich and diverse agenda in front of us. I'm keenly looking forward to it. And I thank you very much to let us have an exciting debate. Thank you very much.